The next item of business is debate on motion 14160 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on building a social security system together, co-designing the social security charter. May I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to speak to and move the motion for up to 12 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week I stood before the Chamber and outlined the great progress that has been made since the passage of the 2016 Scotland Act, including plans to reform disability assessments, successfully making Social Security Scotland's first payments, and being in a position to deliver Best Start grants by Christmas, more than six months ahead of schedule. And today, following the publication of our interim findings, I will set out in more detail our work to develop the Social Security chapter, Charter, yet another example of how hard we are pushing to create a better system for the people of Scotland. Any discussion of the Charter should begin with the principles it must reflect, principles which establish human rights, tackling poverty, respect and dignity as the cornerstone in which our new system will be built. I believe that the spirit of cooperation that led us to those statements of ambition set out in the Social Security Scotland Act rank among the finest achievements of this Parliament. It speaks to our capacity to look past political difference, to work together on our most fundamental shared goal, to make things better for the people that we serve. There are members on all sides of the chamber who deserve credit for their role in that work. Adam Tompkins and Jeremy Balfour clarified its legal status. Alison Johnson and George Adam helped shape the principles. Mark Griffin strengthened the consultation requirements. And thanks to Pauline McNeill, the Charter requires parliamentary approval, a democratic seal that ensures that our founding ideals for this public service can never be forgotten. But they will recognise, as I do, that the work of this government and this parliament is also shaped by our responsibility to carry those ideals from the statute book into the everyday delivery of services in a way that will be meaningful in improving, in improving people's experience. And that is the purpose of the Social Security Charter. The Charter will reflect the principles of our new social, social security system. It will explain in clear, concise terms what people are entitled to and what they can expect from the new system. It will describe some of the specific actions that the system will take to ensure that those expectations are realised in practice. During the bill process, the message from stakeholders and committee members was clear that the people of Scotland should be at the heart of the Charter's design. So we have worked to give faithful effect to that remit. The process we have developed with the guidance and broad support of stakeholders builds on the strength of our existing engagement and it substantially exceeds the consultation requirements set out in the Act. We have recruited a core group of 30 people from our experience panels to oversee the Charter's development. This includes everything from decisions on the Charter's structure and appearance, the language it should contain, right through to the real substance of what the principle should mean in practice and the kind of policy commitments that would get us there. This work will be bolstered, bolstered by individual interviews with people unable to travel to a central location and through a survey of all experienced panel members, ensuring that our engagement goes both deep and wide. This is an exemplar of a human rights approach in action. There are few, if any, parallel examples of governments empowering citizens to jointly lead policy work of this prominence. To get this right, we also need the support and the expert advice of Civic Scotland. And that is why we have established a stakeholder group composed of 27 organisations and chaired by Dr Sally Witcher to provide feedback and advice to the core group. And its role will grow as this work progresses. Presiding officer, I've explained that this process goes well beyond what the Act requires of us, but we do not rest on our laurels. Like anything new, like anything innovative, there are indeed lessons that we must learn. The core group is carefully balanced, reflecting a broad range of needs, perspectives and characteristics. We received around 300 applications for the core group, but the initial composition of that group did not include people from a black and minority ethnic communities. So we have gone further 
and working with stakeholders, we have run sessions taking in the perspectives of refugees, asylum seekers, people from black and minority ethnic communities and transgender people. Further plans are in place to run targeted sessions with people who are often especially marginalised, BME women, gypsy travellers and women who have experienced particular hardship and barriers. And since we have designed a model in which a core group of citizens are empowered to share decision making, we think it's imperative that the perspectives of young people and those from black and minority ethnic communities are represented on it too. That's why I'm pleased to announce that due to this work, we have added representation from BME communities, young people and the wider range of LGBT people to the core group. Presiding officer, having explained the process, I will now turn to the interim findings that we published last week. I had the pleasure of meeting the core group in Dundee on the 23rd of August. They shared with me very powerful experiences of adversity, stigmatisation and suffering at the hands of the UK system. And I would like to thank them for the time that they spent with me that day and telling their stories. Stories that sadly will be all too familiar to many of us who have heard them in our constituency offices the length and breadth of Scotland. As one group member put it, for years I've had to fight them every step of the way. It's like being Harry Potter trying to find the philosopher's stone, but in this story you're the villain and not the hero. But they are not there to dwell on the feelings of the past. They're there to build a better future for their fellow citizens. And the group's thinking speaks to that optimism and that creativity. They want staff who are patient and kind, who see them not as numbers on a screen, but as individual people who understand their circumstances and what that might feel like. This reflects a wider movement in Scottish public services, and it, it is right that this new system should be a standard bearer for this kind of approach. The group sees this being achieved by involving people with lived experience in staff training, a powerful proposal that I intend to progress. They want a system that's also on their side, not against them, filled with people knowledgeable about social security and related services, and people who use that knowledge not to catch them out, but to simplify processes, maximise incomes, and to direct them towards services that can help tackle poverty and improve their well-being. To achieve this, they have spoken about the necessity of recruiting staff who are well-trained, well-led, and who share the values embodied by the principles. Because a staff member who cares, who is happy, and who is equipped with the necessary skills is always more likely to deliver a better service. They are also clear about their status as people accessing a public service. They want to be active partners, to understand decisions, the reasons for them, and how to challenge them if they disagree. They emphasise a culture of learning and improvement, where feedback is valued, mistakes are acknowledged, and processes are in place to ensure that things are done better in the future. And they reaffirm what most of us here already know, that the shameful regime of disability assessments requires root and branch reform. The scope of their ideas extends beyond the operational to the systemic, they speak to the need to end stigma and to the restoration of social security as a public good, a service there for all of us, should we need it, and that's a source of national pride because of it. This reflects the principle that social security is an investment in our people and in our country. That, of course, was the original intention of the Beveridge Report. Many of us here today will agree that we seem to have lost something precious along the way. The group's proposed solution is for government to lead work to publicly challenge stigma and the false, divisive and exceptionally hurtful political rhetoric that causes it. And I can confirm that we are committed to giving careful thought to how all of these proposals can be delivered. Presiding officer, the picture that emerges from these findings is of the potential for a charter that is rich in ambition, a charter that truly fulfils that human rights aspect to social security held so dear in the passage of the, so the Social Security Act. And it underscores once again that how we administrate social security is not just a matter of policy detail. It's a moral issue. It speaks to the character 
of our country and the type of country that we want to live in. Our principles and how we give effect to them matter to people's lives. Reflecting on my early weeks in this role, and of all the people that I have spoken to during that time, the word that I keep coming back to, keep returning to, is trust. It is clear that one of our shared successes is that through the Act, through the principles, through the Charter, through the introduction of new forms of assistance and the commitment to reform assessments, the people of Scotland are beginning to put their faith in us that this new system will really be different for them. I believe that this trust is the single most precious commodity that an elected government and indeed a parliament can have with the people they serve. It is hard won, but it is so easily lost. So I wish to place on record my personal commitment to honouring that trust with action, showing through the evidence of what we do that this government means what it says. And there is, of course, a role for Parliament in that too. It is clear that the Charter is something that we all believe in, and it is my sincere hope that we can continue in this spirit of collaboration to support the work of the people who know the system best and to whom it ultimately belongs, the people of Scotland. President Officer, can I close by moving the motion in my name and thanking everyone, particularly our core group of experienced panels who have helped so much so far in delivering our interim findings and I look forward to their further work in delivering a charter that this parliament and this country can be proud of. Thank you. I now call on Jeremy Balfour to speak to and move amendment 14160.1. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I uh, move the amendment uh, in my name? Can I welcome uh, the debate uh, this afternoon and can I welcome the journey that uh, the Government and Parliament has been on over the last two years in regard to Social Security? I suppose the fundamental question is why have a Charter? And for me the reason to have a Charter is to improve the experience of those using the Social Security system. We want everybody who will come in contact with the new Scottish Agency to have a positive experience, even if you do not get what they want ultimately out of it. And this is what we as a parliament, and I would suggest the Scottish Government, we need to strive in for. So what is the role of the Charter? Well, the danger is, and I think the danger of the committee recognised early on, is that it would simply be um, a bunch of words on a notice board that would be ignored by everybody else. And I think part of the journey that the committee and Scottish Government have been on is to show that the Charter has to be far more than that. It cannot simply be words, even simple words, on a board. It has to be something that people understand and can respect and act upon. It's there for staff to understand what their responsibility is to claimants. It's there for claimants to be able to understand what they should expect of the new agency. It's there for third parties, including this parliament, to hold that agency to account. However, it is important to stress that the Charter does not give individual rights to claimants. What it is there is that the agency can be there to be held accountable by Scottish Government and by this Parliament. And we have to make sure that the balance between individual rights and community rights are held sometimes in tension. So I think it is important that uh, stakeholders, individuals, third parties and this Parliament get an early view of the Charter. And it would be interesting to know whether the Government have a time yet when the Charter will be available for open scrutiny. Again, steps have been taken towards that, but we need a full account of it. We need to know how the Charter is being drawn up, who is involved in the process. Um, I welcome uh, the statement by the Cabinet Secretary today, this afternoon in regard to the expansion of those who are on um, the important 
experiential panel because I know some groups and some people have contacted me in regard to concern that perhaps it didn't represent the whole of Scottish society. But I think it would be interesting to know also how are these experiential panels working in practice? Is it co-designing the system, co-designing the document, or is it Scottish Government going with a piece of paper and saying, like, like it or leave it? How open are we to changes within the social charter and in regard to comments around it? Because we have to make sure that there is gender balance, there's ethnic minority representation, again, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks earlier. Perhaps most importantly, we also need to have disabled people represented on this group. Now that may seem very obvious, and no doubt the Cabinet Secretary wants to jump in, up and say we already have that. But what our amendment seeks to do this afternoon is seek to expand on those groups that government are consulting with. Perhaps groups who are seldom held from perhaps not the obvious suspects that we all go to on a regular basis. Perhaps those who have disabilities which fall into a minority group within disability, which again, aren't often heard. Or can I say gently to the government, also to hear from people who have had a positive experience from DWP already. The, the danger is that we and MSPs are indigenous, people only come to us if they have a negative experience. And there are people, I would include myself, who have had a, a positive experience in regard to the interaction. And we do not want to lose that voice in our engagement either. We have to make sure that both seen and unseen disability is included in any panel and in any drawing up of the social charter. But ultimately, we must keep the goal of having the security, Social Security Act fully implemented, up and running, before this parliament comes to an end in 2021. As one ancient philosopher said, even the journey has to end. And there is a slight danger in that we keep going over and over and over things, and we don't actually get to the goal of being able to deliver the social security system that we all want. So will the Cabinet Secretary, in her summing up, confirm again that every benefit that has been devolved will be delivered up and running by 2021? Will she confirm that they will be run by the new agency and that people will know how it all works? I hope also that we, as a parliament, will have time to consider fully the regulations as they come forward. I, I welcome again, so far, the government's openness in regard to that and looking forward uh, to the Cabinet Secretary being with committee on Thursday morning. But undoubtedly, the most complicated, the most difficult amendments, uh, uh, sorry, uh, regulations are going to be around uh, PIP, DLA, and attendance allowance. And I wonder, in conclusion, can the Cabinet Secretary tell this Parliament when the draft regulations around those uh, benefits will be released? We welcome this debate as a party. We welcome the Social Charter. But we will hold this government to account that it is not simply words, but it's actions that we deliver. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I now call on Mark Griffin to speak to and move Amendment 1416.02. Six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the comments made by the Cabinet Secretary, but primarily I want to thank everyone involved in the experience panels so far. I think you and your almost 2,500 colleagues have a, a big task um, in ensuring that dignity, fairness and respect come to life in our new social security system. We will support the Government motion today and are pleased that the Charter is becoming a reality involving Scotland's people in its design. And just like last week's um, restate of the commitment to ban the private sector from assessments is a critical step in delivering the law this parliament 
agreed to in the spring. The co-design is going to be hugely valuable to the social security system. And I think, put simply, it's about wor working with people on social security, not simply dictating a system to them. The presiding officer, we've seen the horrors that a Tory overhaul of disability benefits has led to. The disabled Scots will lose £190 million, th uh, 190 million pounds through PIP. Hundreds of thousands are only gaining entitlement through court rulings instead of a fair process. And since the last Holyrood elections, 50,000 people have already had to suffer a second PIP assessment under the revolving door of reviews. We all know that needs to change, but it's for those who use social security to say what they want to change. And when the charter is approved this November, almost 18 months since the experienced panels were first launched, members will then be able to point to the tangible difference that underlines our new human rights based system. And as well as celebrating the role of, celebrating the role that the people of Scotland will have in the new system, and this debate serves as a reminder of the improvements the third sector and their members and their service users secured in the Act. But through their campaigning, they secured rights to advocacy, to accessible information and to get hold of assessment reports. And these are hard-won improvements which make this more their system, built with them, not for them. The, as the Cabinet Secretary said earlier, Parliament will give final approval to the Charter. That was an amendment pursued by the third sector and lodged by my colleague Polly McNeill. But for me, two changes stand out. At first, it's because of uh, the Give Me Five campaign that child benefit recipients must be consulted on the Charter. And secondly, um, I worked with Engender, Crer and Scottish Women's Aid to ensure uh, government consults with organisations who work with those at risk of poverty because of their protected characteristics. The scale of ambition behind the experienced panels is commendable and we will support the government's motion today. Um, as our amendment says, when done well, it should be an exemplar that informs how public services are reformed in the future. Uh, Friday's report, however, identifies quite clearly what I had became um, aware of over the summer, that not a single BME person was directly recruited to work on the core group. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned that again um, today, that a focus group of BAME individuals has um, been set up, but the fact that this has just taken place um, has to be of a concern. We know BAME individuals are less likely to access their entitlements and face barriers during the assessment process. Um, so when hard to reach groups have been asked for their involvement, their participation, at the last minute, they, we then all um, lose out. They miss their initial chance to have a say, while local organisations are stretched to get people in place quickly. And then government, of course, lacks the group's views from the very start, undermining its own commitment to equality and the work that it has done so far. And as a result, sometimes things get missed. Page 14 of uh, Friday's report says, Stakeholders added some meanings to the list described above that the core group hadn't mentioned, for example, around the importance of equality and non-discrimination. And that's good that those have been added, but it just highlights what we can miss if we're not all encompassing and making sure we're covering everyone who has been disadvantaged by the, the current system. And before I conclude, as our amendment states, the panels are an open, ongoing process in which People who are entitled to social security are encouraged to enrol and participate. And the cabinet secretary spoke about the 300 people who responded to that recruitment exercise, um, but none of those um, were BAME. And we do have to ask ourselves why and how underrepresented they are in the experienced um, panels. The uh, cabinet secretary told me that a report on protected characteristics will be published in in November, and I would encourage her to publish the details before recess. And with all members being surveyed on the Charter this autumn, I hope the Cabinet Secretary would agree further members um, should be recruited before that survey goes out so that we get their views. And, and welcoming new recruits to the panels, 
along with more open, publicly available means of consultation, I think would be of great value to the process. And um, it might help overcome some of the representation issues I've referenced today. But when the time comes to consider its replacement for PIP um, and carers allowance, the rules, criteria and rates of benefits, once again, the people of Scotland will have their chance to deliver a social security system founded on dignity, fairness and respect. The presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey for six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. There are, of course, a great many things deeply wrong with the UK's current social security system. The real terms value of many benefits has been allowed to fall over time, no longer allowing people to meet a basic minimum standard of living, even to the extent that people can't feed themselves. Just last week, the Scottish Health Survey revealed that 4% of those people surveyed ran out of food in the last year. The system of benefit sanctions leaves people destitute. Uh, and with the benefit cap, the UK government says to claimants they need a certain level of, of benefit, but then pays them much less on an entirely arbitrary basis, sometimes to the tune uh, of £2,500 less. As a result, as the motion notes, trust and faith in, a, in the social security system has broken down. How did we get here? In part, it's because so many welfare reforms have been drawn up by a small group of policymakers working toward a narrow cost-saving agenda. It's based on crude caricatures of the social security system itself and its users with no conception of what it's like, for instance, to be raising uh, a child on a small fluctuating income. All that experience is out there to be used to make better policy, but the DWP has rarely taken much interest in it. From the ongoing farce that is universal credit to the brutality of denying personal independence payment to tens of thousands of people, almost all the major problems of current welfare reforms could have been foreseen, just not by the UK government. It was warned by multiple welfare rights organisations about the uh, impact on rent arrears of uh, having such a long universal credit waiting periods. Disabled People's Group said that the PIP criteria didn't reflect the reality uh, of living with certain types of disabilities and health conditions and that many people would lose out. All of these warnings have unfortunately proved all too prescient. And that's why the approach the Scottish Government is taking set out in the motion is timely and welcome. It's important that we capture the lived experience uh, of applying for and receiving or sometimes not receiving social security. In relation to disability benefits, there is the stress of going to a PIP assessment, sometimes huge distances from a, a claimant's home, the invasiveness of some of the questions that are asked at these assessments, and the bewildering complexity of the process. All of these uh, are too often the experience of people when they ask for support to help them with the extra costs arising from their disability or from health conditions. Their experiences should be brought to bear on how our new devolved social security system operates. And that, I'm pleased to say, is already happening. The experience panels have drawn more attention to the often highly stressful and sometimes damaging experience of just having to go to an assessment. One panel member said, the face-to-face -face assessment for PEP was honestly one of the most traumatic experiences of my adult life. And the report from the About My Benefits and Me survey uh, reported that assessments should only be carried out where necessary and the evidence provided by medical professionals should be enough. Now that was the, the basis for a, a Green Amendment and I'm pleased to say that was supported unanimously by Parliament that introduced a ban on face-to-face -face assessments if the evidence can be found through other means. Another Green Amendment based on uh, what PIP claimants have said in the experience panels and elsewhere ensures that the distance the person has to travel for any assessment uh, that, doesn't prove, that, that, that does prove necessary, that distance will be taken into account. So I was encouraged to hear all of this being outlined by the Cabinet Secretary last week in the Statement on Disability Assessments. 
the proposals on conducting only absolutely necessary face-to-face -face assessments, audio recording uh, for assessments to, to rebuild trust, giving people flexibility in choosing their ass assessment appointment, uh, all of these aspects were set out. And what was outlined there, if it is implemented to its fullest extent, and that of course remains to be seen, but if it is, it could be a significant change to, to, to the disability benefits system and to people's experience of it. I'm pleased that my colleague Alison Johnson has played a constructive role in putting some of these measures into law, but ultimately these improvements are the work of the thousands of people, individual claimants, who have spoken out about their treatment, their experience, and I'm glad that their voices are now being heard. I think we also need to think through, presiding officer, some of the implications of what the motion says about how the system will be established. As, as I've noted, the lived experience uh, of people has been used well to shape the founding legislation, but that was the easy bit. None of the major benefits have yet been established, and as that work proceeds, the people and the organisations that the Scottish Government are co-designing the system with will continue to call for changes that won't be cheap or easy. They'll continue to call for benefit top-ups to reverse the benefit cap and the ongoing freeze on the value of, of payments. Those with experience of PIP will likely ask for a reversal of the staggering cuts to that benefit, and undervalued carers, especially those, for example, who care for more than one person, may well ask for that extra care to be recognised through carers' allowance. And the response at that point cannot simply be that those requests are unrealistic. As well as being untrue, because we paid benefits of an adequate rate before and can do again, this would not be in keeping with a truly co-designed system. Closing, presiding officer, I'm glad that we're moving away from the problematic phrase of welfare and reclaiming the language of social security. The system should indeed be social. It's a sign and signal of our duty, compassion and respect for one another. Uh, and that's why, as the motion writes, rightly says, we need to build it together. Greens will support the motion tonight and both the amendments. Alex Cole, oh sorry, I seem to have been cut off somehow. Alex Cole Hamilton, six minutes please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Liberal Democrats absolutely welcome today's debate, as they do also this next frontier in an agenda which has been driven by consensus by this Scottish Government. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary referred at the top of her remarks to principles, and principles really fundamentally matter. I'm also gratified she uh, referenced in the same breath uh, William Beveridge, and I often lean into quotes from Beveridge when we discuss social security in this parliament, because I think presiding officer Patrick Harvey is right. Um, social security is far better an aspiration than the welfare state, because he said, uh, in establishing a national minimum, the state should leave room and encouragement for voluntary action by each individual to provide more than the minimum for themselves and their family. And I absolutely agree with that. That quote is one of the many reasons I am a liberal. Uh, it's about social mobility, it's about dignity, but I think it's fair to say, presiding officer, that in establishing that national minimum at a UK level, we have come significantly adrift of that. So I very much welcome our opportunity here as a parliament to, uh, to create a Scottish social security system, and I am gratified that it is to be underpinned by this charter, by, because who better to define the terms and parameters of this system than those who have lived under the failures of systems previous. A, a charter for me, just in its nomenclature, defines itself as being rights-based. It's about giving people ownership and understanding of what to, uh, what to expect and what they can uh, rely upon in terms of their rights and what, what action they can take should their rights be infringed. And that lived experience is already shaping this new system. As we heard um, in the statement last week, in the conduct of disability, statement, uh, di disability assessments, I think every single member in this chamber will know a constituent who has um, been subject to the assessments of the past and who has suffered as a result the indignity of those assessments of the past. So I certainly welcome the flexibility 
that has been created, in, in the, the comfort that can be extended to claimants in the recording of the assessment process so that they can lean on that should they have grounds for appeal, and indeed in, in the reality that some people will rightly be removed from the need from face-to-face -face assessments going forward altogether. So we, as Lib Dems, wholeheartedly support, uh, as we did last week, uh, the, the, um, the fundamental workings of the new structures being built and indeed the fact that they are underpinned by this, uh, by this panel, or these panels. I think it's really important, though, in the, the conduct of the, these panels that, that we work with the stakeholders to identify the unintended consequences that can come from that. The flexibility conundrum is important here, and I think it's absolutely vital that we do all of the things that the Cabinet Secretary outlined in her statement next, last week to make the assessments less intrusive, easier and built around the terms and needs of the individuals that they are seek to serve. But with that, there is a prob probability of time delays unless we significantly increase headcounts of the people who are commissioned to conduct those assessments. I'm not saying we shouldn't be flexible, but we should be alive to those concerns. And I would be grateful to the Cabinet Secretary if she can try to address those in her remarks at the close of the, today's debate. I, don't, I think this, is, for me, is about not over-promising and then under-delivering, because I think with the greatest will in the world, there is many examples of public policies which were established around the principles similar to those that we seek to foster in the Charter, but then sadly let those individuals they seek to serve down. So I think that we, we can all agree on the tenets that we hope will come forth in, in the conduct of this charter. I hope very much that the Cabinet Secretary and her government are reflecting on the views of those stakeholder organisations who are seeking to influence uh, the, the process, that there is a great deal of expertise there, not least with the individuals that have lived experience of going through uh, the systems that went before it, but who lean into those organisations that provide advocacy and uh, who gather information and research to make to the betterment of this project that lies ahead of it. For me and for the Lib Dems, this uh, can be distil distilled down into three basic areas of principle, that we do foster that safety net from cradle to grave that Beveridge first envisioned, which allows people to be both socially mobile but protected at times of crisis and of need, not driven by monetary considerations alone. I think in times of austerity, that is often all too easy for governments of all hues to, to look at the bottom line first and foremost and design a, a, a welfare state or a social security system around that. But most importantly, Deputy Presiding Officer, this has to be about the management of expectations, that people have faith and confidence in a system that does not put artificial barriers in their way to, to the assistance that they need and they deserve, but it seems to be fair that they have access to information that is swift and reliable and accessible, and that they have confidence that should a decision be turned against them, that they know the route that they can take to have that decision overturned and the confidence that they shall receive fair hearing to that end. I think if we can uh, work with those stakeholders to foster a charter which captures those three fundamental principles, then I believe that this parliament and this Scottish government will have gone some way to have answered the challenge that Beveridge set in his earliest vision. And with that, presiding officer, I offer the government support of these benches for the motions tonight, the amendments from the opposition parties, and I welcome this con consensus that we continue to move forward together in. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of up to six minutes, please. Bob Doris, followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm currently convener of the Social Security Committee in the Scottish Parliament. I succeed Claire Adamson, MSP, in that role, and I pay tribute to her work as convener and to the work of the committee, where there were a number of changes in recent weeks. Yesterday, our committee visited Dundee. We visited both the DWP's Job Centre Plus and Scotland's new Social Security Agency whilst there, both important meetings. However, our most important visits were meeting those with lived experience of the benefit <laughs> system and vol volunteers who offered their support to them. Some of the stories we heard were quite disturbing in terms of how the UK benefit system handles claims. Unfortunately, it only served to cement much of the experiences I have heard about in my own constituency casework from those who need to interact with the UK social security system and in particular with universal credit. 
I want to highlight a few of the issues within the UK system by way of contrast with what we are seeking to do here in Scotland, because at the heart of this debate is how we can get the Scottish system right at the first time of asking. Get it right by listening to those who have lived experience of social security, the system, and where possible to have them co-producing that system. However, in relation to the UK system and the rollout of universal credit, I genuinely don't believe anyone with lived experience of the system would support a system that forces claimants to wait at least five weeks under universal credit to get recourse to public funds and instead reliant on DWP loans. This is causing real hardship, pain and indebtedness. No one with lived experience would require a family to have to reapply for housing benefit element of universal credit to go direct to the landlord simply because they'd moved house. This has caused constituents of mine rent arrears to accrue and threaten tenancies. No one with lived experience would put at risk child tax credits to working families under universal credit by potentially putting conditionality onto workers that being code for possible sanctions if they, can, if they can't secure a wage rise, a different job or an increase in their hours of work. That's what may happen when Job Centre Plus move away from what is currently being called a light touch system. I just don't believe these things and many others would have happened had the lived experience of those who interact with the UK system been truly listened to at the time when the, UK, when the new UK system was being designed. Now we're left with a situation where we're trying to retrofit and fix some of those weaknesses. And I hope to do that constructively with uh, our partners in the UK government and everyone else to do that because we have to do it. By developing Scotland's social security system with that lived experience, we are doing all we can to build the key principles of fairness, dignity and respect. Crucially, by looking at co-design of the Scottish system in partnership with those of lived experience <laughs> of the social security system, we hope to avoid the issues that has beset the UK system. It is in that context that I warmly welcome the progress made in developing the social security charter so far in conjunction with experienced panels. The Social Security Scotland Act uh, 2018 quite rightly requires the first group of people to be consulted uh, on the chart of those with physical or mental conditions that have experienced of benefits that are being devolved. And I very much welcome the format that consultation is taking, taking what I would consider as a, a layered approach. So yes, a core group of volunteers for in-depth work, individual sessions with people or groups who do not wish to be part of that group or are unable to join that core group, but also a survey of the, the wealth of experience we have with the 2,400 people registered with the Social Security experience panel. So that kind of layered, nuanced approach, I think, is the right way to take this forward. I also welcome the firm commitment within the Social Security Charter and indeed the system itself that sees Social Security entrenched within a human rights-based approach to treating claimants or clients. The system where people have a right to financial support in times of need and are not receiving a handout. I believe if we get this right, the terminology such as handout will be confined to the dustbin of history for good, because that's the right thing to do. The Social Security Charter is vital, therefore, as it will draw together what we as a society wish our Social Security system to deliver for clients, for staff, for society. Uh, due to time constraints, um, I wouldn't say as much about that as I would like to. But there's a bit in the, the recent document, the update from the Scottish Government in relation to the, 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 the preparation for the Charter that talks about culture. And culture is incredibly important in relation to designing this, this system. And when our committee visited the new Social Security Agency in Dundee, I got some really strong reassurances. We met the Chief Executive, David Wallace, and a number of, of other staff there. Even in their organisation, they're trying to embed that positive attitude. So in recruitment, they currently have about 90 staff. It will go up to 750 staff. Uh, the sifting process for interviews, anyone who didn't make that initial cut were given detailed feedback on why they didn't make that, that initial cut and offered support should they wish to reapply when other jobs came online. Those who tried to apply online for a job application with them but didn't actually complete the forum, they were identified also. And they were written to and said, we noticed you showed an interest in applying for these jobs. You didn't complete the forum. Was there a barrier there that we could work with you in relation to doing more in relation to that? So culture is everything. And a final bit of the culture that the new Social Security Agency is trying to do, uh, we saw a whole series of post-it notes up in the wall uh, in relation to the new carer supplement uh, that they are now delivering. 
and they were really positive. I'll just give uh, two, two of them. Uh, one person told uh, an advisor he had answer when they found out the supplement. A second person said, whoopee do, we won't always get it right, but right at the start of this process, we are getting it right by listening to people with lived experience of the social security system. Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, there have already been some positive contributions from around the Chamber today and good discussion about the feedback from the first steps of the co-design process. However, I'd like to reflect not simply on the intentions of the Charter, but what can be done to make it useful. The Scottish Government noted last year that a Charter was a popular idea. The same was true when John Major introduced his Citizen Charter initiative back in the 1990s. The risk with such documents is the potential to slip simply into the aspirational bearing little relation to the services that are actually being delivered. In its position paper in September 2017, the government pointed uh, to one of the main proposed areas where a charter could have value is in translating the core principles from a high-level statement into commitments to deliver specific measurable outcomes, establishing a strong link between the principles and the way that a system actually performs. Ministers will not find a great deal of dispute there. But we are left with a considerable number of commitments and expectations that ministers have crafted. It would be very useful to know both the detail of how they will be measured and the Scottish Government's approach. To give an example, in her statement and in the answer to questions last week, the Cabinet Secretary pledged action on geographical inequalities, on the outcome of assessments, on, uh, on reducing assessment waiting periods, on reducing the appeals caseload, on reducing staff turnover amongst assessors, and pledged a presumably significant reduction in face-to-face -face assessments. But as this Parliament will expect to see these promises match with action, the action must equally be met with measurable, measurable quantitative data. To refer back to the policy paper produced by the Scottish Government last year, it said, the Scottish Government has noted the concern that it may be difficult to demonstrate progress against relatively subjective concepts such as dignity and respect. The Scottish Government is therefore think thinking carefully about how it might employ techniques of a more qualitative nature, such as survey data, feedback from individuals, focus groups, or an ongoing role for experience panels. As I previously touched on, the Scottish Government's approach to this will be all important. With high political expectations, I hope that the temptation to fudge the measure, measures of their performance will be avoided by ministers. If they intend to carry the Scottish Parliament with their proposals, it must be matched with candid assessment of the execution of their new powers and where they have fallen short of expectations. To refer again to the Cabinet Secretary's statement last week, she mentioned the regular independent reviews that have taken place at UK level of PIP assessment programmes. While she characterised this as simply tinkering around the edges by the DWP, I believe that both the PIP and ESA and independent assessments have been a valuable tool for improvement. With that in mind, I would be interested to know what analysis ministers have made of these independent assessments and how the lessons from this process could be reflected uh, in uh, measuring objectives against the standards that are to be included in this charter? Will they subject themselves to the same level of scrutiny that the DWP has in the past? Now, as my party spokesman for jobs and employability, I'd also like to reflect on one particular element which should be central to a number of the principles set out in the Social Security Act. That will be the ability to transition people who are out of work into meaningful employment and to come, overcome the barriers that they face. A key power to influence this is the devolution of the employability services. Again, measurable data will be important, as will lessons from different providers in different parts of the country, creating a transparent process by which they can share best practice. I would also quickly say that there is perhaps some contradiction between the Cabinet Secretary's language last week against outsourced providers for assessments being driven by profit alone and the use of such providers to support people into work. And I would gently uh, suggest that these organisations are either valued partners or they are not, and to consider the messages that are being sent by the words we use in this chamber. The objectives of dignity and fairness in the social security system certainly extend to providing a service to individual claimants and value to the taxpayer, both points enshrined in the Act. One element of fairness that I would mention, however, is the consistency of approach. The Cabinet Secretary has criticised the rigid inflexibility in assessment procedures, However, basing entitlement on consistent and objective criteria is critical to ensuring that any system is fair. Personalised assessment and objective assessment are not contradictory. 
In closing, I would also like to, uh, to refer back a little to the issue about geographical inequality. As a representative of the Highlands and Islands, my region contains many of Scotland's remote, rural and island communities. There are a number of challenges for a social security system to operate as effectively in these areas as it does elsewhere, while also making sure that it takes into account, into account the needs of individuals of these in these areas. The Cabinet se uh, Secretary said that no matter where people live, Scotland's social security system must deliver and must give people access to the same quality of service. I would like to see that included in the face, uh, on the face of the social security charter and for the Scottish Government to consider how the Charter will be impacted by the principles of the Islands Act. It will also be important that the information is available at a suitably localised level for us to see where inequalities of access or outcome exist, and for action to be taken to address them. Presiding Officer, there is a still a considerable body of work to be taken forward in these areas. I do, however, welcome the work taken on co-design of the Charter, as well as the wider work being taken forward by Ministers and the Scottish Parliament's Social Security Committee. I'll finish by saying I cannot under overestimate the importance of getting it right in this transitional period and laying the foundations for a system of support that works for everyone. Claire Adamson, followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think most of us in the chamber were here this afternoon when the Reverend Dean MacDonald was speaking to us about vision and uh, on a very reflective afternoon I was reflecting on, on how vision um, affected our debate this afternoon and I think it, it, it kind of sums up where, where we are now with the Social Security Act and how we are taking forward some of the proposals in that. Um, it was a visionary of the government to approach the Social Security Bill in the way that it did. It was visionary of the committee to have um, conducted the deliberations and the scrutiny of that bill in the way it did. And it was a, a privilege for me to convene that committee following on from the groundwork of Sandra White. And um, I want to thank all the members of that committee for their contribution in, in improving and securing uh, a bill that I think that we we're all very rightly proud of. Um, uh, no more so than uh, the Minister Jean Freeman um, on the day that we passed that um, it was evident from across the chamber that something different had been done uh, in approaching this new social security system for Scotland and um, it, it was something that I think that we should all take forward and um, there wasn't one of us that day that thought the job was done we knew the majority of the work for the Social Security Act was still to come and the majority of the work was still to be done and, and there was much to do going ahead. And uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned trust in her speech earlier on. And uh, um, to my mind, um, the measurement of how successful this will have been or not is whether the trust of our, our citizens is restored in a social security system in Scotland. Much has been said about the experience panels and I think this has been such an important part of the development of this bill. The experience panels have provided uh, opportunities for um, information. They've um, been very, very successful in informing the, the committee and the, the government and the process of what's happening. I was delighted to hear from the Cabinet Secretary that they, they are further surveying the experience panels as the Charter is developed to ensure that um, it is in, indeed a genuine co-production that comes forward. And uh, it's the whole vision of the, the Social Security Charter itself, which is absolutely unique uh, to what we have. And uh, as, as I said, um, thanks to the work of Pauline McNeill, this will be something that will be scrutinised by the Parliament itself, ensuring that the principles, the rights of our citizens are respected and that we get this right in Scotland. And much has been said also about the human rights approach. And I think this is... Um, so important to um, what we have um, going forward. Um, I think the, the Cabinet Secretary said that it was unparalleled um, to have a human rights based approach to a bit of legislation and, a, and, and to a, a social security system in the one we have. And I think it reflects the vision of the government going forward. And in, indeed in the programme for government, they also said they would enshrine children's rights and incorporate the principles of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child into our laws in Scotland and I think that vision 
for the society we want, for how we want Scotland to view human rights, both of our adult and child populations, is very, very important and speaks to the vision of what, what we have before us. It's also about empowering our citizens. And this is so very important because so many times um, we hear stories of people who feel disengaged from society, disengaged from uh, the whole process of, of what they've had to go through in the current DWP programme. And I think, um, you know, empowering our citizens to be active in the decisions about themselves, to be active in creating the laws round about them and, and actually influencing something that's going to bear a part in their lives going forward has been hugely important and we've talked lots as well about lived experience and uh, the, there's a, an old proverb that says that you, you don't really understand a person till you've walked a mile in their shoes uh, and like many members here I think my experience of the constituency is I'm very humbled to, to realise that I've barely walked a step in some of the sho shoes of the people that have come to me at the most difficult time in their lives, um, facing um, problems with um, whether that's been through sanctions, whether it's through PIP assessments, whether it's through the stress of having to navigate a system where they, they have ended up in um, having to take loans from the DWP or from um, the, um, the local authority just to get by and be able to, to sustain and feed their families. And I think that lived experience um, while we, we, we haven't, may not have it ourselves, has been so vitally important for us to understand the pressures that people are under. So I, I am truly um, hopeful that the, the principles that we all agreed, those of dignity and respect that we've spoken about, will be included in this new um, system, the new social security system, and that the charter will reflect that and ensure the rights of of our citizens going forward. If I could just say one thing, um, there was, uh, Mr. Halcor Johnson's talked a lot about the qualitative information and how important that was. Um, that's all very well, but if we don't listen to things when they go wrong, such as a system where, at the moment, where 50% of appeals are successful, to me, that's a broken system. So it's all very well having the statistics and the information to back things up, but we have to listen when we've been shown and told that things aren't going well for our citizens. Thank you, presiding officer. Pauline McNeill, followed by Shona Robson. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, like other members, I'm proud to have been part of the process of co-designing Scotland's new social security system, a very powerful feature of our devolved settlements, and I believe it will prove to change the lives of many people. We all played a part, Scottish Government officials, the Social Security Committee itself, formerly convened by Sandra White and Claire Adamson, who played a key role. Third sector organisations, so many to mention, I will mention a few, that I worked with, Child Poverty Action Group, Sam H, Justice Scotland, the Health and Social Care Alliance, eh, Marie Curie and Engender, just to name but a few. There are many more. I think we're in a reasonably good place. As Bob Doris, current convener of the Social Security Committee, said yesterday, our visit to Dundee, I think, was a historic occasion because we witnessed the very beginnings of our new social security agency. I think it's good for the city of Dundee and the city of Glasgow, but also for the local authorities round about um, those cities that it will bring hundreds um, of jobs and a new way of working. We believe that it is a human right to have a certain approach to social security, one that is based on dignity and respect. So the Charter will be a meaningful one because it will be subject to regulations put before Parliament with parliamentary scrutiny approved by this Scottish Parliament. But most importantly, the Charter will be made publicly available so people can see how their rights are contained in the Charter and hopefully, in plain English, they can see how they can enforce their rights. Citizens Advice Scotland says that the purpose of the Charter is to empower people to use it to challenge substandard service or seek redress. It's certainly one of the core principles for me. And the Charter defines what people are entitled to expect from Scotland's social security system, requiring ministers to ensure that independent advice is given and that the Charter takes into account for the purpose of any court hearings. An amendment that Adam Tompkins, who on the committee at the time, put through, and I think in an important at an important point legally. There is some unfinished business, I think we'll all agree, and um, 
Just um, for the benefit of the record and also for the new minister, there's a couple of issues that I've been pursuing I would like to mention where I think more work needs to be done. So section 53 of the Act uh, requires uh, the duty to inform about the possible eligibility of another benefit. So we're making a determination as to an in individual's entitlement for assistance. If it appears that the individual might be entitled to another benefit, then that individual must be informed. And I'd like to see that that provision clearly marked out in the Charter, because I think it's a really important principle. It's not an automated benefit, but it's one that places duties on ministers to make sure that they maximise the benefits that people might be entitled to. Sam H want a specific commitment in the Charter to promote well-being, which I support, and I think it's a critical principle, part of our social security system. And East Scotland wants to ensure that the Charter is dementia-friendly by consulting carers and families. I know this is already underway. Um, Age Scotland also note that the system should not be digital by default and I think we heard yesterday in Dundee that that's not going to be the case and I really think that's a very, very important point, uh, I think a very progressive one that uh, the government have already given a commitment to. So I think it's fair to say with the work done by everyone previously mentioned, Scotland's social security system at the moment looks vastly different from the current UK system and that's certainly something that I'm very happy about. The Child Poverty Action uh, Group, amongst others, raised concerns about the redetermination process, consequently the appeal system. Evidence shows that a high proportion of people drop their claims and they do not appeal unfavourable decisions in the current system. A series of government amendments, including um, that the paperwork would go directly to the first tier tribunal from a determination, I think was an important step in the right direction. But what I asked ministers for and they agreed to in rejecting the amendments that I put down was that we would monitor the dropout rate for appeals to make sure that people weren't simply dropping out because of the complexity of the system or a lack of advocacy. I've consistently called for ministers to ensure that there is fresh judiciary training for our new social security system. And I do believe there should be some new appointments to the tribunal system to mark its importance. Because if we've changed the culture of our social security system, if we expect decision making to change, I do think that this is the missing link in all of this. We need to make sure that we have a judiciary that has come the journey with us because they will be making some key decisions. I remained concerned and still remain concerned about the structure of the offences and investigations. Um, my amendments were unsuccessful, um, but just to lay out my concerns, a failure to notify a change in circumstances or pass on vital information to, for, a, a, for a particular claim um, requires that a person ought to have known. And I was concerned that that was so widely drawn. The government amended that to give a defence that if a person didn't do that reasonably, um, then they could rely on that. I, I just asked the minister just to pay particular attention going forward it may be a few years hence from now but i think we need to make sure that that provision in section 71 to 73 um, does not catch out people who innocently do not provide information um presenting officer in the final few seconds i just really want to say i do believe we have a statutory framework in place that appears to have the right balance of a robust and efficient system but one which applies dignity and respect to those who are part of it and rely on it. It is the detail of the regulations, I think it was Jeremy Balfour who made this point, a really important one, that going forward, it is the role of this parliament and the Social Security Committee to make sure that all of those principles are enshrined going forward when we see the detail of those regulations. A great deal of work has gone into getting to this Please stage, and I fully appreciate speaking. that. It's a big moment for the country, a big moment for the parliament. Thank you. Paul Shona Robson to be followed by Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I want to tr pay tribute to all those who have got us uh, to this stage in the journey to build a dignified social security system here in Scotland, including the work on the Charter. I do feel a little bit late uh, to the party, so it was great yesterday to uh, have the Social Security Committee uh, in Dundee taking evidence particularly from those with lived experience of the existing welfare system and its failings. Like many in this chamber, I've uh, met with constituents who have been left destitute in vulnerable situations and with families on the breadline relying 
on food banks and of course part of our visit yesterday was to two of the food banks in uh, Dundee and they shared with us some of the very difficult circumstances and what a, a lifeline the service they are providing is to, to many people. Just last week I had two constituents uh, came to see me because of universal credit. Both had been left without a penny and are now for the first time in their lives in a situation where they have rent arrears and all of the implications of that. And despite trying to explain their current situation to the DWP and the potential risk of eviction, they were met by a, a cold blank wall of refusal. And of course, these are not isolated incidents by any uh, manner or means. I had another constituent uh, whose child was ill, which resulted in them missing their appointment at the job centre, but they couldn't phone to cancel as they didn't have enough money to put credit on their phone. The following day, they walked to the job centre to explain their situation, but without uh, any discretion was sanctioned. And this family of two was left without money for two weeks. Members across this chamber will recognise uh, the type of, of stories here. Just yesterday, I met with Ewan Gurr, who many in this chamber will know and have probably had lots of dealings with. Ewan was a Trussell Trust uh, manager not too long ago and established the, the Dundee Food Bank and has witnessed firsthand the reality of policy decisions that have been made uh, by the UK government uh, on welfare. And some of the statistics that Ewan told me were quite staggering. Uh, in 2012-13, the Trussell Trust Food Bank received 14,318 referrals. One year later, that number rose to a shocking 71,421, an increase of 499%. Uh, and I think we have to ask ourselves how uh, in a developed country in the 21st century uh, with the fifth largest economy we can think uh, this is acceptable. And we heard very much from the food banks yesterday about how vital their service uh, is, but importantly what they want uh, in the new uh, social security agency uh, here in Scotland is a very different ethos. And so I am relieved that the Scottish Government is now taking control of some aspects of our social security system. I wish it was all, but uh, the, it is a, a start. And the Charter, uh, as it develops, I think will help to enshrine the ethos of dignity uh, and respect. And I, I believe that my constituents and the rest of Scotland will have access uh, to a compassionate, person-centred system uh, through that agency. And treating people as people, not just a, another number, and treating people fairly with the dignity and respect that they deserve and a system that people can rely on and trust and one that is fair. So I think uh, the um, Scottish Government should be commended for the hard work and this Parliament should as well because there's been a lot of cross-party cooperation. Uh, when Jean Freeman as the Minister for Social Security visited my constituency of Dundee City East last year, she visited the Brooks Bank Centre, which is a charitable organisation who offer money and debt advice to people within the city. And during this visit, uh, Jean Freeman met with a, a group of people who were given the opportunity to share their experiences with her directly. This, along with other similar events across Scotland, has allowed the Scottish Government to develop a bottom-up approach to the new system and has set the tone for its creation. People now feel involved in the creation of our social security system. They know it isn't just a cosmetic exercise, but one where they are actually being listened to. And organisations such as Brooks Bank feel as though they've been able to directly influence how the system is shaped and how it works for our communities. Jenny Gillanders, the manager at Brooks Bank, who was actually at the, uh, met the committee uh, last night, says that the feeling there and other similar projects throughout Dundee is that the Scottish Government are coming into the already established partnership networks and becoming part of the sector, not part of the problem. Ginny has told me that the information her project has been given from our new agency is concise and well organised and that it means that they no longer have to worry about chasing payments that people are entitled to, enabling her advisors to focus on other issues in the benefit system uh, caused uh, by the uh, complex uh, UK system. And although not all of the new agency is operational yet, and we saw um, some of that yesterday, uh, the, the expansion uh, of the job numbers there, uh, the, having a, a system operated locally does mean that projects such as Brooks Bank can build relationships with staff and resolve issues much sooner. That partnership work is key. It's a key to the ethos and culture of the new social security system and is key to getting it right. 
And if we get things right now, then we can lead the way in the future and have a flagship social security system that is looked on as one of the best in the world. The new agency with its charter is off uh, to a good start. Yesterday, we saw the feedback from those who have already received the carers supplement. And I would also want to end with one of the, the post-its on the wall, and that was that that's a Brucey bonus. I think that sums it up. Officer. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Green, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, by <clears throat> excuse me, 2021, Scotland will be responsible for making more social security payments in a week than we currently do in a year. This is a, a massive undertaking, uh, which the former social security minister called the biggest shift of powers to Scotland in over a decade. It will be no small feat and require a huge deal of preparation. The devolution of Social Security is undoubtedly complex, given the intertwining nature of, uh, of benefits, both UK-wide and any devolved uh, deviations. So as the Charter enters its early stages of preparation, I think there's a lot here to welcome. Uh, but from the briefing papers we've been sent as MSP, MSPs in advance of today's debate, I think there are still some areas to consider, and I hope the Minister is open to listening to those. This debate is entitled uh, building a, a social security system together. Now, much has been said today about the Beveridge Report in uh, 1942. Um, it was a 300-page report. Uh, they only meant to print 70,000 copies, but in the end, it was such a, 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 an interesting piece of work that no one had really done before. They ended up printing 600,000 copies. Uh, such was the interest in the topic of welfare. But one of the recommendations of that report I found interesting it says that policies around social security and i quote from the report must be achieved by cooperation between the state and the individual with the state securing the service and contributions the state should not stifle incentive opportunity and responsibility it should leave room and encouragement for voluntary action by each individual to provide more than that minimum for himself and his family it talks about that cooperation between state and the individual. I think it was true then and it's still true today. Building it together couldn't be a more apt way to approach this in Scotland. The state to those whom it seeks to help must work together with those that it does help if that contract between one and another is truly to work. But when our welfare system was created, uh, it was a different world. Society has changed much since the days of beverage. Academia has consistently been there in the background to remind us that amongst the statistics, women, ethnic minorities and people with disabilities are represented differently uh, when it comes to employment and welfare outcomes. Uh, across BME groups, employment levels are lower, much lower than the national average. For example, currently 77% of Caucasians are employed, whereas only 55% of Pakistanis or Bangladeshis are employed. So if Scotland's Social Security char Charter uh, really does need to ensure that it serves all ethnicities in Scotland. Uh, the core group set up by the government includes a, a very welcome diverse range of stakeholders as those with uh, mental and uh, physical disabilities represented as well as the LGBT community. But there are over 200,000 people in Scotland from a BME background. So I really hope that the, uh, the ad ad adequate place is given <clears throat> to them as well. I welcome the creation of the experience panels, which I think were set up to gain the insights of uh, over 2,000 people who uh, have had experience with the system. And I think, after all, anecdotal experience uh, from on the ground can and help uh, uh, shape uh, welfare policy. Any of us who deal with uh, welfare-related casework in our day-to-day -day roles will have had first-hand experience of some of these problems. And I think by default, as Jeremy Balfour said, we often deal with problems, difficulties, and indeed failings in the system. But also experiences aren't always negative. I've met some uh, uh, excellent members of staff uh, who've been very helpful and sympathetic uh, with constituents in my dealings. So I think it seems practical uh, that we should get honest and realistic feedback from those who the service uh, is used by. It's the most direct way to learn if the decisions that we make or that ministers make uh, are actually working on the ground. And I think we should be open to evolution. But I think it's also important uh, that the system is accessible to all at a basic level. 
So I, I welcome decisions made that the charter should be straightforward, uh, using common sense language, uh, rather than hiding behind bureaucracy or jargon or buzzwords or just niceties as these charters often are. Uh, we should also listen to stakeholders such as Age Scotland who highlighted that not everyone is uh, digitally literate in Scotland and we should make sure that uh, copies of this are available within local communities uh, using local authorities. Uh, the government's position paper outlines that the Charter should also provide for strong scrutiny and accountability and that's something that I welcome. A report from uh, the Disability and Carers Benefit Expert Advisory Group published at the end of last year uh, gave some suggestions about how that scrutiny might look. They highlighted the importance of an external body to ensure the independence of uh, scrutiny. Uh, given this and uh, the wealth of evidence uh, in favour of that, uh, in, uh, I uh, support the uh, prospect of an independent body and I think the Scottish Commission on Social Security should be afforded the independence that it needs. In closing, starting officer, can I reiterate the comments uh, made at the beginning of this debate by Jeremy Balfour? that many organisations have customer charters. Uh, they sit proudly on the walls of their offices and are given out to people in nice leaflets. But the charter should be more than that. It should be an ethos. The Minister opened today's debate by praising the consensual nature by which Scotland's social security system was introduced and agreed to. And I think that whilst we will have political differences that will set distance between us as parties, I do hope that there is an earnest and genuine will to make a success of this new agency and the people it seeks to provide for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Green. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Alec Rowley. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Dignity, fairness and respect are important words. They're important principles. We've used them a lot and should make no apology for that. Keeping these important principles central to everything we do is essential to avoid the mistakes of the previous system which, despite the experience of a lucky or some might say privileged few, is a system which has caused harm, stress and worse to countless vulnerable individuals and was described as the UN, described by the UN as a grave and systematic violation of human rights for those with disabilities. Now, presiding officer, I'm very clear that if even one person suffered the indignity described by the scores of people that the Social Security Committee heard from, by the scores of folk that come through our constituency offices, that that would simply not be good enough and that system would have to end. Dignity, fairness and respect are important. And it's also important to recognise the progress that's been made in working with the experienced panels and others to develop Scotland's Social Security Charter. The historic Social Security Bill established the first UK social security system based on the principle that social security is a human right. At the time, it was really heartening to note the unequivocal support from across the parliament and from external stakeholders alike for the broad principles and aims that underpinned the act and the creation of our Scottish Social Security Agency. By working in partnership with the people of Scotland, by listening to, by valuing and acting on the expertise and experience of people who use the benefit system, our SNP Scottish Government are demonstrating a commitment to turn those principles into reality. The Charter is intended to turn the principles into more focused aims so that they're open to monitoring and reporting. Of course, governments, no matter how good their track record, need to be held to account. A publicly accessible Charter communicating in clear terms what people are entitled to expect from our Scottish social security system helps do that. Social security is an investment in our people, it's an investment in our country. Social security is a public service. With the Charter explaining in clear terms what the new system will do to give practical effect to the principles, and by working in partnership with the people of Scotland, we can build trust and create a binding contract between the system and the people who use it. To do that, it's crucial that commitments to co-design are realised. And I would echo the assertion of Inclusion Scotland in, in their briefing that co-design has to be about a partnership of equals, with professionals and service users working together in an equal and reciprocal arrangement. And for disabled people to bring their important lived experience, including experience of the current benefit system, to the discussion, we have to ensure that the right support is in place and that any barriers in place which prevent them participating 
on an equal basis with others are removed. And I would include in that any barriers around um, disparity of power. And I, th I think that we know from experience that disabled people's organisations' involvement helps effective participation. I would reflect on a recent general comment from the UN Committee of the Rights of Disabled People, which stresses the importance of state parties giving particular importance to disabled people's organisations. I'll quote it directly. Organisations of persons with disabilities should be distinguished from organisations for persons with disabilities, which provide services and or advocate on behalf of persons with disabilities, which in practice may result in a conflict of interests in which such organisations prioritise their purposes as private entities over the rights of the person with disabilities. State parties should give particular importance to the views of persons with disabilities through their representative organisations, support the capacity and empowerment of such organisations, and ensure that priorities given to ascertaining their views and decision-making processes. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments and um, read the further work around targeted groups to increase diversity. Another issue that was raised by Inclusion Scotland, though, was around whether the core group is sufficiently representative of different types of impairment, particularly learning disabled people or people with other cognitive impairments, such as autism, to ensure that the Charter reflects their needs. Now, I accept and recognise that with a, a small group of around 30, there will be challenges around publishing um, details of partic particular protected characteristics. However, I'd welcome um, some comment and um, some reassurance from the CABSEC on this in her um, summing up. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I think that it's clear that the Scottish Government are going way beyond warm words when it comes to putting dignity, respect and fairness at the heart of our social security system. Having expressed provision for the Charter on the face of the Act, the commitment to the rights-based approach is clear. The Charter gives practical effect to the important social security principles and evidences that the SNP government will treat people with dignity and respect. Principles into action to make lives better. I'll finish by simply thanking all of those involved in this very important work. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms Maguire. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Alistair Allen. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The progress being made with the introduction of the new social security powers in Scotland has been commendable and I consider the inclusive approach to the design of the social security system to be groundbreaking. For those who have not experienced what it's like to try and access support through the social security system, the film I, Daniel Blake was surely an eye-opener and is a clear demonstration of why those who use the system need to be at the heart of not only designing the new system, but also being able to continue to feedback on how that system works in practice. Developing the Social Security Char Charter is just the next step in that groundbreaking process, and it is therefore important that the approach of inclusiveness and engagement continues. I believe that by taking the much welcome principles that sit behind the Social Security Act, the social security system in Scotland and setting these out in the social security charter, we will empower the users of the system as well as the staff who deliver on a daily basis and the organisations who support people that have a need for support. Presiding Officer, the Social Security Scotland Act 2018 gives the following formal functions to the charter requiring ministers to ensure that independent advice is available on the Charter's content as part of advice on social security issues, enabling it to be taken into account by the courts and tribunals on relevant matters, requiring ministers to report annually on what they have done to meet the expectations set out in the Charter and requiring the Scottish Commission on Social Security to report on how the Charter is being fulfilled and make recommendations for improvements. Citizens Advice Scotland state it is of the utmost importance that the Charter is ensuring that it is not just words. The Charter must strengthen the guiding principles by embedding them into the system in a practical sense. The Charter should be used 
for training all staff who will come into contact with those needing support from the system and in doing so will support staff to deliver on the agreed principles. To empower people, the Charter must be clear, accessible and well advertised. People who do not receive the service they are entitled to should be able to use the Charter to challenge substandard service and seek redress. Citizens Advice Scotland are right when they say empowering people who require support is in the best interest of the whole system. When service falls short of the necessary standard, people who know their rights can challenge this, which in turn helps to ensure that a high quality level of service is maintained. Why is this important? I think it's important that we always make clear that social security is an investment in the people of Scotland. It's an investment in the communities of Scotland and it is an investment in the wider economy of Scotland. The principle that the social security system is to contribute to reducing poverty in Scotland is one I'm sure all of Scotland supports. However, that is dependent on the ability and willingness of the government of the day to raise the finances and commit the resources. I believe that one of the most alarming developments of modern day Scotland is the rising levels of child poverty in Scotland. Nearly two in five children face the prospect of poverty in Scotland by the end of the next decade. This represents a near 50% rise in the number of child poor from today and almost doubling since 2010. 400,000 children will be in poverty by the end of the 2020s. This is a figure far higher than even the Thatcher major years when child poverty rocketed. As the Institute of Public Policy Research recently said, the scale of the financial challenge of reducing child poverty will likely need concerted action for many years, requiring a combination of increased earnings for the poorest households through inclusive growth and increases in social security payments. The figures, shocking and alarming, but confirmed in the Joseph Rowntree report on Scotland published today, which highlights the scale of poverty and should make us both sad and angry. While today, half the children, 56% and out of work families are in poverty, the figure will exceed 90% by the late 2020s. As the report says, the escalating poverty crisis is driven by substantial cuts to social security benefits and tax credits and the introduction of universal credit, which will be rolled out by 2023. So while I accept that we cannot mitigate all the ills of Tory welfare policy and failed Tory austerity, I suggest that tackling the growing levels of child poverty will be essential to achieve the principles that sit behind the, Sco the Scottish social security system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr Allen, please. Presiding officer, as members know, uh, many constituents uh, facing sometimes dire situations come to their MSPs for help with benefits issues. They do so and will continue to do so regardless of whether the benefit in question is devolved or not. With the devolution of a number of benefits to this place, however, at least in one limited respect, it can be said that the actual powers of Holyrood have caught up with the expectations that their constituents rightly have of a parliament. I want to say something about how the benefits uh, now devolved to us uh, should operate and on that I hope there might be a more than usual degree of consensus, at least in some things. We should consider, uh, as is being considered, what principles we are starting from and what lessons we can learn from the social security system as it has operated up till now. These principles are a good point to work from. They are principles born not merely out of consultation with service users, but as others have mentioned, out of genuine co-design. These are principles endorsed unanimously by this parliament and set on the face of an act. So now we have a rare opportunity to try to get it right, at least for the 
15% or so of the social security system that is being devolved to Scotland's control. And that means translating these principles into a social security charter. But it is important to say that the charter is more than merely a general statement of goodwill. The Scottish Government and its agencies will not only be measured against the Charter, but organisations who believe the system is failing will be able to use the Charter to make that point. The idea of social security as a rights-based system founded in ideas of human dignity is a radical idea. Indeed, it is arguably a radical departure um, from the ideas of uh, social security that have gone before, which come from a system uh, historically derived ultimately from ideas about things like a deserving and an undeserving poor. So writing a charter now provides an opportunity for something better, something more clearly founded on ideas of human dignity and equality. I want in doing that to mention one group with a particular importance in my, my part of Scotland and that is namely those benefiting from cold weather payments. Now at least Five or six of our starting principles could be invoked uh, as reasons for my raising this issue. I've raised the issue of cold weather payments on numerous occasions in the past with the UK government. And like other members in the west of Scotland, I recognise that the current threshold for the payment of cold weather payments is very high, or if we are thinking of it strictly in temperature terms, very low. The temperature in any area has to fall below freezing for seven nights in a row before the payments are triggered. And on the west coast of Scotland, this is, of course, something of a rarity. And yet, areas like my own have some of the worst levels of fuel poverty in Europe. Now, there are many explanations for this to do with housing type and so on. And much work is being done by the Scottish Government, it should be said, to address these problems. However, another factor uh, is, of course, wind chill. The weather which hits the west coast in the winter may not be literally freezing, but it certainly feels like it. So I would again make a case um, for all of us to think about the questions uh, that arise around the arguments for wind chill to be taken into account when payments are calculated and to look at those seriously as we think about the principles for our new system. Presiding officer, as many uh, members have pointed out, we have to build a, a new social security system that is based on people's lived experience of the existing one. There will be an estimated £3.7 billion pounds fall by 2021 in payments in Scotland of the benefits which are administered at a UK level. That is a huge slice out of the incomes of hundreds of thousands of Scots, which no amount of mitigation by this Parliament can possibly make up. And as members will have seen from evidence provided uh, by organisations including Engender and others, between 2010 and 2020, 86% of net savings uh, uh, along those lines um, will come from women's incomes. So these provide huge issues for us to, to think about uh, as we think about how the devolved benefits uh, relate to those uh, which still operate across the UK. And, presiding officer, that may all be a debate for another day, um, but we will continue as MSPs to get inquiries, as I say, about both devolved and reserved benefits. And in the case of Scotland, I hope that our charter will ensure that there is a system which is at least accountable and listening and founded in meaningful guiding principles, principles which I hope are shared across this chamber. Thank you very much, Dr Allen. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by George Adam. Mr Adam will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be able to take part in today's debate on Scotland's Social Security Charter. With 30% of working age benefits being devolved to Holyrood, as well as additional powers to top up existing benefits to create new ones, this gives us a very exciting opportunity. And many speakers have talked about that this afternoon. But also, uh, it's important that there is a responsibility that comes to considering how we deal with a distinctive welfare system in Scotland, with options that look at serving and in securing the best we need for the people within Scotland. The inclusion of the Social Security Charter within the Social Security Act is very much welcome, Deputy Presiding Officer. Not only was it set out with the Scottish Ministers what is expected of them forming the Social Security Policy, it would also be developed in consultation 
with the people who rely on different types of social security on a day-to-day -day basis. So the key people who are actually needing the service need to be part of that process. And the approach of engaging with a broad range of people designing this new welfare system is the right one to take. While the core group drew upon a wide experience of panel uh, individuals uh, who are mixed receipt of a range of different types of benefit uh, and their different gender and different locations, uh, I was a little bit surprised before uh, the debate started today about the lack of young people and ethnic minorities. So I'm delighted to see that the Cabinet Secretary has now brought that in case because I do think that is the right thing to do, that we broaden the net as wide as we can to incorporate and include as many people as we can uh, in this whole process. It's also important to find out what the social security support mechanisms are there. And notwithstanding some of the concerns that there are, the recommendations that is here seem to be sensible, they are reasonable, and they are appropriate. And that's what people want to see, something that deals with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, people want the system to treat clients fairly, the system to treat clients with respect, and they want staff to be appropriate, kind and understanding, and the system itself is clear, simple and easy to navigate. These are the priorities that must be in, in taken within this process. And I'm glad to see that many of these are being followed, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm sure that it's the, the support mechanisms that are put in place. And we will get support from not within this chamber, but outside the chamber, if we are prepared to take that seriously and tackle it head on. Uh, and I think today uh, that the Social Security Charter is doing exactly that. We do, however, need to bear in mind that no matter how strong Scotland's social security chapter may be, it will depend how well it is implemented. It will depend on how far it goes and what it does to ensure people get that respect. And the conclusions that have come forward uh, from, from individuals must be taken into, in, into account uh, to ensure that the system is proper and the management systems are in place. But there are some real issues about the implementation. And I need to uh, talk about what Audit Scotland talked about when they looked at where we were. They reported early in the year that the implementation of the Scottish welfare system would cost and that would have an impact uh, and that, that, that may well, the Scottish Government may well have underestimated some of that impact. So that needs to be solved if that problem has been identified. Uh, and I'm sure that the Scottish Government will take that on board. Moreover, the, the new body uh, that we're going to have will, will require many staff, and I know the Scottish Government has already transferred a number of individuals to cope with that system uh, to ensure that the staff are in place and the project. Uh, but also Audit Scotland highlighted concerns over the, the ne necessity of staff numbers that could be recruited in time to make sure everything was devolved. So once again, that needs to be looked at to ensure that we can achieve the goals that we're setting ourselves. We want this to work effectively, uh, and we want this to work for everybody. But Audit Scotland have a role to play in advising and coming up with some possibilities that could cause us concerns for the future. And then when we talk about an IT system that might be, have to be involved, that we already know, presiding officer, that the track record of the Scottish Government on IT has been difficult. We can just look at Police Scotland or Farm Payments or NHS. So I, I, I leave that there. Uh, that is a, an area. Uh, we need to ensure that things are fit for purpose. And I'm sure that will be looked at and that will be addressed as we go forward because that's vitally important. There are some really positive progress that's being made. Uh, and, and I commend and congratulate for what we are doing and the people who've sat on the panels, the core groups who have taken part in ensuring that this charter will be a success. And I have no doubt that the charter will be a success, but it has to be the culture of that success that works for all. We must keep in mind the difficulties of setting up a new system, and we also must keep in mind that that has to work for all. So we in the Scottish Conservatives are very supportive of what is taking place, but we will hold the government to account if things don't work. Surely. Minister. Presiding officer, um, I'm, I'm very heartened to hear Alexander Stewart's uh, comments about co-production and how valuable that is. I wonder if Alexander Stewart would recommend that to his colleagues in Westminster for the DWP to take the same progress and make the same progress that we've made in Scotland. Alexander oh. Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank you for the comment. I, I, my, my colleagues in Westminster, I, I am fully aware of what they are trying to achieve, uh, and they do that. I, I, I am aware of that, that situation. Uh, but you make, a, you make a valid comment, and one that we, we can all work to try and achieve, but as I say, they are, they, are, they are taking that on board. So I pay tribute, Deputy Presiding Officer, to all who have worked on the committee so far in this. I pay tribute to the panels that have taken place. We all want this to work for individuals who require support. The Act 
that we put forward in this parliament was pioneering, and it should be. So I support that, and I support everything that's been said today. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. An immaculate speech, apart from the fact that you used the term you. I will persist in correcting members on this. I'm now going to call George Adam, last speaker in the open day, moving to closing speeches afterwards. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I, like uh, colleagues, welcome this debate, and it comes in the back of a lot of work from all the members of the Social Security Committee. I particularly liked Pauline McNeill's opening, being uh, us, us, those of us on the committee, uh, being co-producers of this social security system. But of course, presiding officer, my own natural humility would stop me from making that statement myself. But Polly McNeill is 100% right. The Social Security Act was a creation of all of us in this place and those outside it who contributed through the experience panels. Presiding officer, this Social Security Charter goes beyond warm words. It goes beyond listening to people for the sake of it and beyond the usual government practice of top-down ideas. This is a social, a social security system created in conjunction with those that use it. This is the Social Security Charter creates a binding contract between the system and the people of Scotland. This is not some framed document that will hang in the wall of a Social Security Scotland's office and gather dust. It is a working document, a living document that builds the very foundations of our social security system. It sets out what people in Scotland can expect and are entitled to from our new system. The Act requires the development of a charter that reflects the eight social security principles set out in Section 1 of the Act. During the Bill's progression, Ministers committed to producing the Charter, working with people with experience of Social Security. The Charter is intended to turn the principles into more focused aims so that they are open to monitoring, reporting and scrutiny. But more importantly, the Scottish Government has not just listened to, but acted on the wishes of those with lived experience. The very naming of the char uh, Charter was brought by the core group discussions and their clear preference was for the Scottish Social Security Charter. The format of it had to be accessible and ensure that it did what it set out to do. If there's one thing I've learned, presiding officer, during my time in local government and here in the Scottish Parliament, is whether it's the civil service or council officers, they all like to write long reports and papers. But this is so much more important as these has to be long, uh, but it also has to be short enough for people to be able to understand. It has to be able to be grasped by individuals so that they know exactly what the right is with this document. These were all things that the core group brought up and shows once again how valuable their input was. The principles of the Charter are important and as politicians, we love principles. Some of us have them and value them. Others, we can only hope they catch up with the rest of us someday. But overall, find, the overall finding was that all the principles separately had important aspects and meanings to the core group. But there is also a significant overlap. They came up with a list of 45 statements that explained what the principles mean in practice. And these statements can be grouped into five themes. And I think, presiding officer, is an important part of the debate. Number one was clients. As the people involved, dignity and respect should not just be words. The clients should be first and foremost most important in the whole process. Number two, staff behaviour. Ensure that those delivering these services do so in a way that is helpful to those that are claiming. And three, processes. Ensuring that they're open, transparent and not a hindrance during people's time of need. And four is the social security system itself, and the five, the wider culture of social security in Scotland should be a positive one. For me, the most important aspects of all of this is the process of consultation and co-design that help build trust in the Scottish social security system. Trust in a benefit system is something that there has not been a lot of recently with the UK government's so-called reforms. This has been an important part of the exercise and it's only right that people feel that trust between the system and themselves when they go through the process. The Equality and Human Rights Commission noted the co-production model can help develop positive working relationships between claimants and frontline staff and that, presiding officer, is an important part of the debate as well. The Act sets out eight principles for the Sc Scottish Social Security. Although all valid, my particular favourites are that the Scottish Social Security is an investment in the people of Scotland. During their time of difficulty, during their time of need, we are there to support them. Two, the Social Security itself is a human right and essential to the realisations of other human rights. 
and also the fact that respect and dignity of individuals is to be at the heart of the Scottish security system. For too long, these things have just been words and not actually been used in other processes with the DWP. And the Scottish social security system is to contribute to reducing poverty in Scotland. It's an important part of how we build a better future as well. Presiding officer, this is some of the largest legislation that this Scottish Parliament has produced. It affects so many people in our country and can be used as a tool to bring people and families out of poverty. But before all that, you need to state the rules and regulations. People need to understand what their rights are. It needs to be done in a way that people can understand and appreciate. It is my belief that the Scottish Social Security Charter does all of these things. It gives hope to our fellow Scots that our Scottish Government listens to what you say and appreciates your contribution. And as I've often said in this chamber, presiding officer, politics is about people. And if we put them first, we can and will deliver the type of Scotland we all want to live in. Thank you very much, Mr Adam. Closing speeches, I call on Mark Griffin to close for Labour. Mr Griffin, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased that we've had a chance today to agree our support for the progress being made to deliver Scotland's new social security system. The Charter, its co-design, parliamentary approval and the human rights-based approach are key to realising dignity, fairness and respect in the system, a marked change from what we have now. And crucially, it will ensure that we deliver on the law we agreed in April. Though it should embed all the principles in a way that is understandable in plain English, the Charter is a key way of realising a core principle of the social security system. The social security system is to be designed with the people of Scotland on the basis of evidence. The Charter is, of course, about people and their rights. To be effective, the Charter has to clearly state social security recipients' rights, setting out how to complain when things go wrong, and they will, and who to complain to. And though my attempt to amend the Act to pay due regard to the Covenant on Economic and Social Rights was not accepted by all members on the committee, the Charter should also embed another core principle, that social security is itself a human right and essential to the realisation of other human rights. We've heard today about the importance of ensuring that the Charter should be rooted in panel principles, a call made in the Alliance's briefing. And Jeremy Balfour echoed Kaz and indeed my earlier comments that other individuals or organisations with an interest should be consulted as part of the scrutiny process. Pauline McNeill spoke about the parliamentary approval ahead and like her, I would be keen for the Cabinet Secretary to spell out the intended timetable for that. Alistair Allen mentioned the issue around cold weather payments in his constituents. And similarly, in central Scotland, we have the position where uh, residents in Coat Bridge and Airdrie are, have their um, weather conditions taken by two separate weather stations, one in Salisworth, one in Bishopton. So we have two houses side by side together with each other, where one house received four cold weather payments last winter and one only received two. I think that's something that the Cabinet Secretary could look at and I welcome Dr Allen's comments around that and hopefully that's something we could all work together on. And in their briefing, the Alliance suggested if Parliament considers extending the time to develop the Charter to ensure that the process is led by free, meaningful, active and, and informed participation and not overly driven by time constraints. And on that, I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary's response. Our amendment refers to the process being one that is ongoing, something that echoes Sam H's call that the Charter should be considered as a live document. And as I've said, we on these benches would like to see a push to recruit more members to the panels, which could encourage more hard to reach groups to come on board and for that process to be more open. And I, I hope the Cabinet Secretary agrees because I think there is room to improve. In June, the Cabinet Secretary's predecessor, Jean Freeman, told me that almost 1,000 of the 2,400 experienced panel members have failed to engage since that initial recruitment. And that suggests that something has not quite fully worked um, as part of that programme for which £300,000 has been invested um, to date. Anecdotal comments about the nature of the short, sharp research and the timings and methods of engagement suggest that the work could be better built around members. 
And to underline the, the point that I've made today, that the panel should be designed with people as opposed to for them, or otherwise built around the needs of the Scottish Government. And opening up the panels further, making more up-to-date information available, perhaps through Social Security Scotland's excellent new website, could make them more accessible with earlier notice and with greater detail of forthcoming work, but also providing more live details of the feedback coming out of them could increase the value and the engagement with the panels further. <coughs> the, the recently published Experience Panels Research Plan says that we should expect reports on the funeral expenses assistance service design, the carers allowance supplement letters and the PIP assessment process this autumn. But on all three counts, Government have either published its draft regulations, sent the letters, or last week confirmed its position on the assessment processes. Um, so th I think there's a question as to how the, the experienced panels will then feed into those particular um, entitlements. Presiding officer, in May and June, um, Jean Freeman responded to questions from Polly McNeill and Daniel Johnson that mobility criteria was under active consideration, but the plan doesn't include that. And the questions about um, offering mobility to over 65s and reinstating the 20 metre rule are key priorities for us. And I hope the Minister can confirm that they are very much under consideration by the panel. And earlier, I reminded the Chamber the effect of Tory reforms, uh, disabled people losing £190 million from PIP alone. And that the figures uncovered shown 50,000 people have had to suffer a second PIP assessment under the revolving door of reviews. This summer I've been asking for people's views on what social security likes that at round tables and local meetings and asking disability uh, organisations and disabled people themselves what their priorities are. Because when the time comes to consider the replacement for PIP and carers allowance, the rules, criteria and rates of benefits, it is vitally important that the people of, Ch of Scotland will have their chance to deliver a social security system founded on dignity, fairness and respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Grivner. Call on Michelle Ballantyne to close the Conservatives. Ms Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I hope that at decision time tonight, we will have consensus on today's motions and amendments. And as such, I would echo the Cabinet Secretary's opening statements that this Parliament has, must and will work together to deliver a social security system that works for the people. None of us doubt the importance of getting the approach and the content of Social Security Charter right. The proposal came from the people and we have a duty to deliver a meaningful response to the requirement in the Act. Inevitably, of course, much of the conversation on the development of the Charter will, of course, be about the language. So unusually, I want to start from, with a quote from the Unison briefing. Unison have made clear that they don't like the term customer, but they said this, more fundamentally, whether those using the systems are claimants, users or customers, and whether they are receiving benefits, entitlements or citizen supplements, or whether they receive information by email, text or in person, the crucial factor is how much money people are receiving. No level of semantic sensitivity or personalised user-friendly service will allow for the system to meet principles of dignity and respect. So in creating a social security charter, we must be sensitive to the expectations we are raising and our ability to deliver. And this concern was also noted by Alex Cole Hamilton. Both Jamie Green and, Green and Alex Cole Hamilton highlighted the principles on which social security was established, reminding us that Beveridge was clear that in delivering security, we should not stifle incentive, opportunity and responsibility. And we must leave room for encouragement for voluntary action by each individual to provide more for their family. My colleague Jeremy Balfour talked eloquently about the role of the Charter and the importance of it being more than words, of its role in clarifying expectations and holding agencies to account. He reminded us of the legal importance that the Charter is not about individual rights, but the principles on which Scottish social security system will operate. I was also grateful to Jamie Halcrow Johnson for touching upon the importance of tangible outcomes with regards to the Charter, as well as raising the comments on PIP and ESA independent reviews at UK level. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary will address some of the questions Mr Halcrow Johnson raised. 
It is, as Jamie Green highlighted, vitally important that current, current levels of scrutiny continue to be applied to benefits once they are devolved. And the Charter can provide the mechanism for that, whether in relation to ensuring geographical equality or as an opportunity to provide ongoing improvement to the system. Presiding Officer, many members this afternoon have acknowledged and welcomed the co-design approach that is being taken. And as Bob Doris, Shona Robson and other members of the Social Security Committee mentioned, our visit to Dundee was about listening and gaining an understanding of the experiences of those who use the system. Communication in design and communication in delivery is vital. As Pauline McNeill and others have mentioned, it is important that the Scottish social security system is not digital by default. And Age Scotland's briefing reminded us that the Scottish Household Survey found that 67% of those aged 75 and over don't use the internet. I believe we all welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement that the membership of experienced panels has been expanded to be more representative, as it is important that a broad range of voices are, is captured. Ale Alexander Stewart spoke insightfully on the need for broader representation on the core group, and hearing from those people who have had positive experiences is important, not least to try and understand why it worked for them and not for others. Presiding officer, if the Charter is really to provide a guiding influence on our system, then we need to get it in place. Ideally, it would have been in place already prior to the delivery of benefits to ensure consistency across the board, particularly as, in the Scottish Government's own words, the agency complaints and appeals procedures will also be strongly reflective on the values and standards set out in the Charter. This document will form a key tool for those seeking redress, so it is important that we get it in place as soon as possible. So on a final note, when reading through Friday's report, I was struck by one comment in particular from a member of the core group. It was the suggestion that the Charter be placed conspicuously right in the eye line of Social Security Scotland staff that are dealing directly with the public. I believe if we truly wish this Charter to succeed, we must be proud of it. As Alexander Stewart said, this is key the respect we build through being proud of it is what will take it forward. It is a symbol of collaboration between service users and staff and government, a common touch point they can all refer to, and a guideline on what to expect once they cross the agency's threshold. I think the suggestion of an eyeline charter is a good start and a contribution that should be borne in mind as this charter takes place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Palatine. I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to close to the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary to decision time or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome today's debates and the contributions that we have had. I, I think it befits the importance of the Charter that we've been trying to and have indeed succeeded to achieve a great deal of consensus today. I'd like to thank the members who <coughs> contributed and spoke very supportively of the work that the Scottish Government has been doing, but more importantly, the work of the experience panels and our stakeholders in bringing this to life. And I repeat that this work is fundamental to the wider necessity that we have as we develop our social security system about building trust with the people of Scotland. We need to demonstrate through our actions that we will honour the trust by delivering on our commitment to do things better. And in my opening remarks, I spoke about my genuine desire to carry on the collaborative approach that was clearly established by my predecessor <clears throat> through the progress of the bill. And I'm pleased that that has continued today. Of course, we won't agree on um, everything, but I do think it has been uh, made clear today that we do agree about the nature of this new public service and about the role of the chapter in it. And with that in mind, I am pleased to support Mark, Griff Mark Griffin's amendment uh, to the motion. I very much agree that this is a process uh, that should be an exemplar of co-production and that we should continue to work to expand the diversity of those participating in co-design. Mark Griffin talked, uh, talked a great deal about the importance of 
co-design and quite rightly it is their system as he said not something that's been done to them and that's why I do take very seriously the comments that he Jamie Green and others have made for example around um, the issue that uh, no members from um, black minority ethnic communities were on the original core group we do have to ask ourselves why um, people from certain communities didn't come forward to be part of that and that is very much a process that I'm open to. We need to learn lessons from this innovative process that we are doing in co-design uh, because I want to do this better in the future. Um, interestingly enough, we are also having a great deal of, of interest from other administrations and governments about how we are carrying out our co-design work on this. And I think it speaks to the innovative nature of what we are trying to do here. So very much open to learning lessons and learning them quickly. Ruth Maguire and Jeremy Balfour also raised issues about re the represented, representative nature of the core group. As I think Ruth Maguire herself pointed out, there are difficulties about talking about the protected characteristics of a group of 30 people, but I hope I can reassure her uh, that we do include people with a disability, including mental, physical and learning, men and women, a range of ages, people with different sexual orientations, people who are married or in civil partnerships, different religious beliefs, experience of all relevant benefits, people with fluctuating conditions, people with hearing impairments, people with visual impairments, carers of both adults and disabled children, rural and urban dwellers, and uh, people with um, more than one of those characteristics, obviously, as well. We are working closely with stakeholders to ensure that the views of people from some of the hell groups or underrepresented groups are included in the work that we do within the Charter. Um, I'm also um, very pleased to say that uh, we will be supporting Jeremy Balfour's amendment uh, tonight as well, considering how we might include the views of organisations and individuals within the work that we are doing. Very much from the beginning um, of the principles and of the Charter, they have been a product of wide consultation and engagement, and I'm committed to doing my part through the co-design process to have focused discussions with stakeholders. We do already have our stakeholder group of 27 organisations and many are also meeting with um, officials. Uh, the officials' uh, door and my door um, always will be open to those uh, with an interest in our system and a wish to contribute to that. Jeremy Balfour and others uh, spoke about why have a charter and that it has to be more than a, a bunch of, of words. Um, and I, I absolutely agree with him on that. George Adam talked about this being a working document, a, a living document, um, and also I, I completely concur with that. The interim report that was published at the end of uh, last week um, has a great deal of work that has gone behind it. It is an iterative process. We are early in that process. Uh, but I can assure Jeremy Balfour and others that this is a very open process. There is much capacity building that has gone on with the core group to ensure that it absolutely is not officials sitting saying, what do you think about our ideas, but very much led from the core group um, themselves. The Charter we expect to be able to lay before Parliament before the end of its year. It's not for me, obviously, presiding officer, to judge how Parliament will settle a timetable from that. Uh, but um, I am um, obviously open to the committee and um, to um, opposition parties for suggestions about how we can take that process forward. Jeremy Balfour also um, discussed um, and, and asked me about the delivery of other benefits um, and we will be taking responsibility for all benefits by the end of the parliamentary term. We will be moving forward with policy, for example, um, on PIP and that is on going through our experience panels and the expert advisory group and the regulations will come in due course after that. Patrick Harvey uh, raised a very important point that I think we should always reflect on is but how did we get here that we have a system that is so absolutely mistrusted by both the people who use it and indeed anyone that hears anything about it. And that is exactly why, as he correctly points out, that this system, our new system, must be developed on the lived experience um, of those. That will be at the heart of everything we do. It will be first, it will be last, and it will be always what we will consider as we develop the social security system. Alec Cole-Hamilton also um, 
asked the government to look very carefully at the experience of stakeholders and their expertise, and I would absolutely um, agree with him on that. As I've already mentioned, we have a stakeholder uh, group that is working uh, to advise uh, the core group and discussions with officials are happening. Bob Doris, Shona Robison and others spoke very eloquently about the consequences of the current system. My own constituency, um, mailbag and surgeries um, also bring that home, as I'm sure it does to all members. But I'm particularly mindful of the visit that I made to Inclusion Scotland um, immediately before I gave my statement uh, last week and speaking directly to people about what impact our policy decisions will have on their everyday life. It is always humbling for us to remember that the decisions that we take in this chamber will make a real difference to people, and I am determined to ensure that that is a positive difference for people who have been exceptionally scarred from their experience of the current system. That's why it's important that we recognise what we're doing here. We're designing a new system. We aren't tinkering around the edges of the current system. And that's why the culture um, in the new agency is so important. And I'm delighted to hear from a number of members about their experience when they went up to visit the agency headquarters in Dundee yesterday. It's an experience um, which I had uh, greatly enjoyed as well because you can tell from the chief executive, from the senior management to all the client advisors that they genuinely get that they are doing something different and momentous here in Scotland and they are part of something historic and very proud of that. And I hope and expect that that will be reflected in everything that they do as they deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Claire Anderson talked um, again about the, the need for vision and the type of society we want to have, and that will be embedded, I know, in the culture that we will have. Paul McNeill mentioned a, a number of parts of her unfinished um, business, probably too many for me able to go through in the time that I have, uh, but I'm more than happy to meet Ms McNeill um, and discuss um, some of or all of those um, with her. But can I reassure her that um, I will look very carefully at what she said around um, the appeals process, for example, and the investigation uh, offences and investigations. She did raise um, some suggestions about what would go into the Charter. Um, it is too early for me to say what should uh, go into the Charter at this point, and I'll allow the core group uh, to comment on that um, before um, I do. Uh, Presiding officer, just in conclusion, uh, I was heartened by the fact that many of the members endorsed the findings from the core group that we've had so far. Our intention, as I say, is to submit the first charter for parliamentary approval by the end of the year. But in many ways, that's the beginning rather than the end of the process. If approval is granted, we then move on to implementation and ensuring that that charter is meaningfully delivered. As Mark Griffin, Patrick Harvey, Claire Adamson and many others mentioned today, the importance of the Charter and what we are doing in Social Security is to ensure that the people's voices will now be heard. I would add to that as well that their voices will now be heard and then this Government and this Parliament will act upon them to ensure that we have a Social Security system that we can truly be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on building a social security system together. Uh, now, before we move on to the next item of business, members may recall that uh, the Commission on Parliamentary Reform proposed that time be set aside uh, during meetings of the Parliament for significant announcements from committees on urgent inquiries or to set out the findings of recently published reports. And as agreed by the Parliamentary Bureau, we're going to be trialling this up to Christmas. Uh, and in that context, I'm pleased to uh, call on Bruce Crawford, uh, convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee, to make an announcement on common UK frameworks. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As the convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee, I welcome this new op opportunity for parliamentary committees to highlight the work they are undertaking. The Commission on Parliamentary Reform are to be commended for making such a useful recommendation. On the first occasion of this new procedure being used, I'd like to bring members' attention to the important inquiry the committee is undertaking into common frameworks. In October last year, the UK and devolved governments agreed that it would be beneficial to establish post-Brexit 
common approaches across the UK in policy areas such as justice, the environment, health, as well as agriculture and fisheries. These areas where common policy approach is currently being delivered by virtue of the United Kingdom being a member state of the EU. The principles under, underpin these agreements have been agreed by the governments, including to enable the function of the UK internal market while acknowledging policy divergence, to ensure the UK can negotiate and implement new trade agreements and international treaties, and to safeguard the security of the UK. So these common frameworks should matter to us all here at Holyrood, as they impact on the policy approaches we scrutinise and will be asked to vote on in future. I know that colleagues in other committees have also been looking at this significant issue. It's vitally important that this Parliament, as well as Civic Scotland, NGOs and other wider stakeholders, etc., have a role in helping to shape and influence the development and agreement of these common frameworks. So in June this year, the Finance Committee began our inquiry seeking written views. We've since com complemented this work with a fact-finding visit to Brussels, where we learned that meaningful engagement undertaking early and often was vital to ensure success in finding agreement. We'll also hold a roundtable discussion in committee on the 21st of October, as well as hosting a conference together with other partners at the Royal Society of Edinburgh on the 2nd of November. Key sectoral representatives have been invited from across the UK, as well as from UK and devolved parliaments and governments. These frameworks are being developed right now, so the Finance and Constitution, Constitution Committee will look to publish its findings as early as possible. This in order to ensure that the Committee and Parliament are involved in helping to shape the direction and development of these frameworks at an early stage as possible. I hope that members will find the Committee's ongoing work and the final report we will produce useful in regard to their own involvement in the development of common frameworks. President Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Crawford. And we turn now to uh, decision time. Uh, there are four questions uh, this evening. The first question is that motion 14142 in the name of Ruth Davidson on a motion of condolence be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next question is that mo amendment 14160.1 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, which seeks to amend motion 14160 in the name of Shirley Ann Robin Somerville uh, on building a social security system together, co-designing the social security charter be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 14160.2 in the name of Mark Griffin, which seeks to amend motion 14160 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 14160 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville as amended is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll move now to Member's Business, or in a few moments, Member's Business in the name of Oliver Mundell on the cycle to Syracuse to mark the 30th anniversary of the Lockerbie disaster. We'll just take a few moments for Members and Ministers to change seats. <laughs>